uh, Clean Air Sheffield is just the name of the group that I kind of invented in the last year. Uh, it came out of a school streets petition that I uh, launched in Sheffield in November time. Um, there's a Facebook group. Um, we made some air quality sensors and pubs in January and February. We had a public workshop at the Diamond at the University of Sheffield in May. Um, this is working with uh, Rohit uh, Chakraborty that uh, Martin mentioned. We probably have about 100. It's really hard to say how many we have for sure. I have a database of, of over 100. They're not all in Sheffield, and they're not all working all the time. I might mention more about that in, in a bit. Um, so the, you know, the, the, the question I was trying to answer really was summed up by this, this Twitter follower of mine who I've not met yet. Uh, if we monitor air outside the school, he's at Westway School, would we expect to see spikes at busy times? It could be used to make the case for road closures. So by road closures, we're talking about school streets, which is uh, kind of a timed uh, road closures, you know, when children are dropped off, when they're picked up again from school. And I had the same question myself back in about October, November time, and that's why I launched the petition. I thought, keep the cars away from schools at drop-off times, pick-up times, maybe we'll get better air quality. Turns out it's not that simple. Uh, I'm also uh, driven by uh, another person. Uh, when are you going to stop measuring air pollution and start doing something about it? That's my six-year-old daughter. <laughs> I've used this slide before. Um, but it's, you know, I have, I'm a father of two children. They go to Hunter's Bar as well. I'm somewhat involved in the, uh, the green screen project there as well with Maria and Rowan. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very, it, you know, it's a good observation. You know, I spend a lot of time collecting data. And uh, yeah, the, I'm, still, I'm still not sure what, what to do about it. And it, I think that'll become more clear as I go on. This was the petition. We got to about 1,500 signatures without <coughs> too much uh, you know, media coverage or anything like that. It was presented at full council in December. And you know, everyone said, what a fantastic idea, great petition, great initiative. We'll have a meeting next month. And then nothing. Yeah. Uh, and there's been a couple of changes of cabinet members since then, which hasn't helped fair to the council. Uh, school streets, if you don't know, started in Italy in the 90s. Temporary school clo uh, road closures, as I said, uh, successfully deployed in lots of places in the UK and beyond, and actually were trialed in Sheffield as part of our last clean air day, which was in June, quite successfully. Um, so can we make, can we use air quality to make the case for these road closures? Well, we have three DEFRA sites measuring air quality in Sheffield. We, uh, the council has six sites. They're not always working, but we have six sites. Um, both of these just give us hourly measures uh, and quite often they're offline for various technical reasons. There's a community project which um, isn't really represented here but there have been people for years in Sheffield putting out and collecting these little NO2 diffusive tubes to measure uh, nitrogen dioxide in the air. Um, but that's not real time. Uh, it's a monthly average and we have to wait four months for the results and they're probably plus or minus 15 to 25 percent accurate so they're not great really. Um, so basically, I wanted to measure my own air quality wherever I wanted, in real time, and for anyone to be able to access this information. It turns out NO2 is pretty hard to measure accurately in real time, so I looked at uh, particulates, which have been mentioned already. So uh, Rohit uh, Chakraborty from uh, Urban Flows Observatory put me on to this project. It's an international project called Luftdaten out of Stuttgart in Germany. And basically, this is what it looks on the inside, this is what it looks like on the outside. There's one of those little NO2 tubes on the right you can see as well. It's made up of an ESP8266. It's a little Arduino board with a Wi-Fi radio on it. It's very kind of low power, low, it's two pounds. You know, it's very cheap. And then it has an SDS11 laser-based particle counter, kind of the bigger square piece in the middle. And they're about, you know, 15 to 20 pounds. They measure particulates down to PM uh, 0.3. BME 280 is a weather sensor, so we get temperature, humidity, and air pressure from these, so we can actually see where these are. You know, Sheffield's a very three-dimensional city, right? We can see where the sensors are in terms of their uh, height above sea level. What are we actually measuring? Measuring particulates. Um, if you look at this, it's a human hair. I think somebody had a human hair on their slide. It said there's 60 microns across. I've got that here. The PM10 kind of would, PM10 particles would make a little necklace around the human hair. And then PM 2.5 would make a little kind of bracelet around each of those beads there, the little pink beads. So these things are so tiny, they get past all our defenses, they get into every organ of the body, the brain, the nervous system, everything. That's why every day there's a Guardian article saying what medical link has been found to air pollution. Uh, these are some of our devices that we made in, in pubs in Nether Edge in the early part of this year. Uh, I've got a couple, uh, actually I'll be honest, I have six at my house. Uh, <laughs> 
um, different kinds of sensors, front, back, inside, outside. I'm a bit obsessed <laughs> with this. This is kind of the, the network diagram, if you like. Each um, of these uh, Luftdaten air quality monitors is attached to uh, a wireless router in someone's house or business or school. And these are connected to the internet. And then I've got some uh, forwarding on these devices to forward to cleanair.sheffield.tdns.net, which basically allows me to forward the data to any database that I want. At the moment, the database is in my house, but luckily, as I found, because I went away for three weeks and the power went out and I lost three weeks of data, the data is also sent to Lufthansa. And so anyone in the world from any device can access all my data and nothing was lost except my own sensors when the power went out. Uh, that's kind of today map of uh, Sheffield. There's almost no pollution today whatsoever. The air quality is very good in the summer um, and uh, probably will continue for a bit. Uh, if you want to see this map, this is probably the easiest way to get this data. You go to bit.ly slash Sheffield Air and Sheffield and Air have to be capitalized as case sensitive for some reason. Um, there's sensors not just in Sheffield but throughout the world. There's 9,000 of these things. You can also get for each sensor, I can provide links if anyone's interested, you can get you know, the last 24 hours, the last week, the last month, the year, the 24 hour running average, uh, PM 2.5, the really little particles, PM 10, which includes PM 2.5 and also temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure. Some people like the map, some people like the graphs. Um, I can make, I've made my own database as well to get all the Sheffield data in one place. And so I can make all kinds of graphs really easily. This is today's PM 2.5 for, for 70 odd locations in Sheffield. Uh, and generally they follow the, you know, the same kind of movement. Uh, it's open data. You can get the data in CSV format for any of the, the sensors. Mm -hmm. There's an API for all the sensors, not just mine. Uh, there's third party apps like Local Haze you can download on your iPhone. Uh, and the Lufthansa project is looking at other sensors that are working on noise right now. There's been some work on NO2, but it's a lot more difficult and expensive. So I'll kind of skip through these. There's four schools that I've been monitoring quite carefully for the last few months and will continue to in the next few years. And I also, because these things are so cheap, I can also put sensors on the way to school, around the school. And I have one of these at low field, which is interesting because it's co-located co with reference sensors. <coughs> so we can actually say, you know, how good are these, uh, how good are these sensors. So that's Hunter's Bar. I've got four sensors there. You can see they kind of move together. This one's interesting, it's low field. It's interesting because this is my 20 pound sensor here in blue. And this is the green line is the, uh, the reference sensor, which has been mentioned before, is worth about 20,000 uh, pounds. The dotted lines are school hours. And you might be interested to see that actually the air quality is at its best during school hours. In fact, the best time of day that I found is kind of four, five, six o'clock in the morning which was a big surprise to me because I wanted to make a case for keeping cars away from school for, on air quality re base, uh, grounds, um, but it turns out the air quality is actually really good first thing in the morning and it just gets worse as the day goes on. Um, Greystone's another school that I've looked at and again what I've done is looked at the hour of day over a period of time, this is about six or seven weeks, and found that the, uh, the air quality is actually better when the kids are at school, which I'm actually quite happy about. I'll just skip through some of these. Why might the particulate uh, levels be higher at night? Air is going to cool at night, so the air falls. The concentration of particulates increases. Humidity could also be a factor. These cheap devices don't dry out the air, so if the humidity is above 80%, they get affected by that. So what determines air quality in Sheffield? So this is what a bad day, air day would look like. This is what a good air day looks like, and you can tell it's very clear that a couple of things here. One is like you get this nasty orange color, which indicates kind of 50 micrograms per cubic meter. This is a day like today where it's maybe single digits or even one or two micrograms per cubic meter. You notice that when it's, a, when it's good here, it's good everywhere. When it's bad, it's bad everywhere. Even Edale doesn't, doesn't escape you know, some of the pollution. And the biggest difference that I've found is, is air direction, air, you know, um, where the air is coming from. So if you're in Sheffield, the air, uh, the prevailing winds should be coming from the southwest. Uh, but if they don't, if they come from the southeast, you see you're picking up pollution from major cities like London, Brussels, and Paris. And that can make much, uh, a huge difference for our air quality. So learning so far, particulates levels not as expected, not easily correlated to local sources like cars, which is what I wanted to do. The readings vary greatly from time to time. Worse during the evening, uh, night, but you know, from after midnight, they start getting better and they improve throughout the day. We can see this across four school sites that I've studied. Uh, school sites luckily are a little bit better than city average, I've found, 
and school sites slight school sites slightly better than the surrounding neighborhood as well, which is which is good. So the implications is we can't rely on pollution levels to justify school streets, but you can see there's lots of other good reasons to keep cars away from schools. The parent that I mentioned at the beginning, the Twitter follower, that he went to a school, his child goes to a school where a child was hit by a car this year outside their school. Luckily they're all right. Um, what would I do differently? Um, you know, I found with these cheap products, the cheap sensors that I have to, uh, the, the failure rate's been higher than expected, so I would, in future, I'm gonna start labeling every single part and making sure I can tie it back to who sold it to me. Is it buying these things in China, but you know, it could be that, that, that a, a particular vendor has a bad batch and you know, I might try to return some if I find that. I do some insect screening. I know Steve's uh, made some nice insect screens on his. Maybe I'll have to convince him to give me some of those. Um, also, the other thing that I would do, and this is kind of getting into the IoT part of it, I would spend less time building and deploying these devices and more time enabling others. So at the beginning, I was doing this in pubs. I was helping the public do it. And I've been in, involved in other workshops in other cities as well. And I think that's really powerful. I feel like we're kind of stuck at 100 right now because I don't particularly have the time to, to take this further, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working on it. Uh, so I think I, you know, in future, if I did this again, I would spend more time on helping other people and I would document things. I would have a website saying, if you want to do this, this is how you can do it. Because even things like instructions are something I've just done very recently. That's it.